Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Women for Kansas and Native American Indigenous Voters of Lawrence Douglas County Candidate Forum. We are here with Congressional District 2. And I wanted to start with Frida Gipp, my colleague and co-host tonight. So Frida, can you start us off? Okay. Um, so we're going to start off with the land acknowledgement. And um, the land that makes up Congressional District 2 has, for the majority of human history, been home to indigenous peoples of the Americas. And we acknowledge the numerous sovereign nations that lived in this region prior to and during colonization. We also acknowledge all of the diverse indigenous nations represented today in the district and their communities. We were unable to locate contact information or a campaign website for the libertarian candidate Robert Garrard. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And Republican Jake LaTurner declined to participate in this forum. The LaTurner campaign told us, quote, we have had an overwhelming amount of requests for Jake to participate in forums across the district. Unfortunately, we cannot take part in all of them. We have agreed to two televised debates that will reach voters in the second district, and we won't be able to make this one work. We, of course, understand the significant demands on everyone's time right now. But we were particularly disappointed by this because the district is home to four federally recognized tribes, the Iowa, Sac and Fox, Kickapoo, and Prairie Band Potawatomi. And the district is home to a one-of-a-kind institution, Haskell Indian Nations University. So thank you, Michelle Daly Isla, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's my honor to be with you all. All right, so if you wanna start us off, can you tell us why you're running for Congress? And if elected, <laughs> what are your top three goals to accomplish in your two-year term? Well, uh, the reason I'm running for Congress is I am not your likely uh, congressional candidate. I am a person that was born in New York, raised in Puerto Rico. My grandparents and several other adults had a lot to do with my life. I learned the value of hard work from my grandparents and also um, having gone through several difficulties to include being homeless, um, having a history of domestic violence in my life, dealing with a catastrophic illness. Um, I understand all too well uh, the importance of healthcare, education, uh, infrastructure, and just jobs in our economy. Um, and, and those are the driving factors that are, are the main issues for me. And the, the number one most important issue was healthcare. Um, we have in Kansas over 150,000 individuals that are either under or uninsured. And we have three lawsuits threatening the Affordable Care Act, which is nothing other than pre-existing condition protection. My job in Congress will be to ensure that the ACA is still a reality and that I work with Kansas legislators to ensure that Medicaid expansion is a reality. A lot of people don't understand that the ACA was designed with the expansion dollars to go into states to help individuals that don't have access to health insurance and that can't have that coverage. And because in our state, our state legislators chose to deny people from that access, we have still 150,000 people that are not well covered. And that is the result, uh, that is now resulting in a crisis in not only our, our state, but across the nation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, infrastructure is extremely important to me, not just for the roads and bridges, but also for broadband. Um, and our farmers and our economy are extremely important as well. Um, we must preserve uh, the supply chain of food that we as Kansans send to the rest of the world and ensure that our farmers who work very hard and the last thing that they want is a hand-me-down. Um, are able to continue the labor of love that they do taking care of our land and ensuring that we have food. Um, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. Thanks. Okay, what should Congressional District 2 constituents expect from you as their representative, even if they didn't vote for you or if they support policies you oppose? In other words, how will you serve all Kansans in your district? So I've made it very clear from the inception of this campaign that I am not as much political as I am concerned about the issues of the people. Um, when I was elected mayor in the city of Topeka, it was by a margin of 500 votes, 501, but who was counting, right? Um, and that means that there was a large amount of the population that either did not come to vote or did not agree uh, that I was the right candidate. Um, immediately upon becoming elected, I was in a really difficult position and had to work with all sides of our community to make sure that our community was able to thrive, um, to make sure that our businesses were able to find places to work and, and become successful, um, work with the Chamber of Commerce to ensure that we have 
uh, a cornerstone strategic plan that is about inclusivity that you don't see that in a lot of communities. Um, and we've been working with across the, the, that's the beautiful thing about being a mayor, you work across party lines. You don't look at potholes as Republican or Democrat. You don't look at families as Republican or Democrats. You look at people as people. So one of the things that I was doing as mayor that I look forward to doing as a Congresswoman is um, a lot of people that run for mayoral positions go to the neighborhood improvement associations, which is the low income areas of the community only when they're looking for being elected. One of the things that we did was that we tried to go to our NIA meetings and bring food without an agenda and just sit with people and understand what the issues were. The other thing that we, we used to do was that we had a podcast that would come out every other week to make sure that people understood the issues and that we were elevating the voices of other individuals in our community. Um, I did a regular report on Facebook on everywhere that I had been. So there was a lot of transparency and, and my number one priority was understanding the needs of my community so that I can serve them. That is the same type of track record that I'm going to bring with me to Congress. I don't care about your party. I care about the fact that you are going to be a Kansan, an American, a person that lives here that I am here to serve to understand how I'm going to facilitate your life by serving you from the seat of Congress. That's the way that I see it, and that's the way that I hope to continue relationships across the district. What is the role of Congress in combating the coronavirus, and what policies will you support to address the pandemic and its effects? So first and foremost, we need to acknowledge that we've had very poor communication from the federal level um, with regards to the, the seriousness of this pandemic. Um, and it's, it's been difficult for us to be able to have free access to, to testing brought in our community. Uh, we need to ensure that our hospitals have the necessary PPE, which is the protective uh, personal equipment that our doctors, our nurses, and everybody that is in the front lines needs. In addition to this, we also need to ensure that we have the proper public health services. Um, contact tracing is so crucial. And in order for us to really take a hold of this virus, we need to make sure that we are able to identify the sources and then help people understand the importance of quarantine. As a congressperson, my role, number one, will be healthcare, right? Which is ensuring that the dollars that are allocated for Medicaid expansion get to Kansas because they need it. Our hospitals need it to ensure that we are able to work with programs so that our small businesses are not struggling. The cornerstone of our economy is our small businesses. The bigger businesses come and go, but the local businesses are the businesses of our neighbors. And those were the ones that by far the most impacted by this coronavirus pandemic. So it's our job to ensure that we're supporting our small business. But in addition to that, supporting our families. There are so many families that have been displaced from their jobs that don't have the ability to communicate the way that you and I are communicating via broadband, right? So we need to make sure that those families that are being displaced by this virus have the support that they need. And it makes me frustrated when I hear that there is a nefarious uh, incentive for families that are receiving support currently. Look, I know a lot of people at all levels of the economy. And I can tell you that there is not one person that is excited about having to stay at home and receive a check. Um, and, if, and if anybody ever feels that people are getting too much money from a federal incentive, maybe the question should be, what's our minimum wage and is it really minimum for what? Um, so, so those are some of the conversations that we should be having in Congress with regards to the pandemic. Because the pandemic is not just a health issue, it's a health and economy issue that we must address. But in order for us to address the economy, we need to have healthy people. What will you focus on in Congress to address climate change and how will you prioritize clean energy in Kansas? Kansas is number three in the nation with regards to wind energy. And I, I think that we need to figure out ways of doing more research to understand how to make solar cheaper. Um, right now, it's, it's one of those things that you're able to have access to it if you have the finances for it, which is rather unfortunate, because especially our families of low income have a higher need for a better and clean environment as well, and they deserve it. Um, but I think that aside from ensuring that through Congress, we are able to continue providing the support for us to figure out ways of expanding renewables across our communities. The other thing that I feel that is extremely important is us having investments and in research into uh, storage. Um, if we are able to harness that energy and store it 
and transmission line support and having uh, supplementary support in people's houses, then we can start really moving forward towards a cleaner environment. Um, people think that, you know, talking about climate change is not something that, that they, they see the impact of it. And my reminder to individuals is, I want to remind everybody last year, I'll never forget as I was flying in and out of Kansas, coming back to Kansas and seeing the, the, his, the floods that were just hurting our crops and how our farmers were being impacted. We need to talk to our farmers about the environment as well, because it is in their best interest to ensure that we have the resources to continue providing food. So for me, I think it's going to be important to create incentives so that we continue investing in cleaner uh, sources of energy to uh, incentivize our communities to start uh, changing, giving them the option to go into greener vehicles. Um, that would be another way to reduce the carbon footprint and working with our farmers to see what are the other solutions that we can start implementing with them as well. Frida? Okay, um, so my first question is, in what three ways will you address social justice issues in Congress? So I think that one of the most important things is there's the, 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 the wealth gap and the income inequality, like I mentioned, I, I hear a lot of people talk about $15 and uh, $15 an hour wages and, and universal uh, uh, revenues. But I think that, look, what, what that does to us is that we put a number down and what's going to end up happening is that that number is never gonna be sufficient, right? I think that we should index our, based on our AMI, which is our area median income, what, what the basic salary and minimum wage is going to be state by state because $15 in Kansas may do a little bit, but it's not gonna do anything in California. Um, the other area that I'm interested in, uh, I am learning more and more about the, the, the inequalities in uh, the justice system, uh, the way that individuals are processed and the lack of real support when um, our families are, are, are having an issue and all of a sudden they try to get a public defender and the caseloads of our public defender are definitely so high that they end up not really getting into the job and, and doing as good a job as they can potentially do. Um, another cornerstone for eliminating and creating systems of equity is our education system. I think that this notion of the federal government investing in, in private schools is something that we should not be doing. We should be figuring out how to ensure that our public school system is, is equipped to, to ensure that our kids from all neighborhoods, regardless of their zip code, have equal opportunity to figure out who they wanna be when they grow up and have all the opportunities possible. Um, another big issue is transportation. Uh, and the other issue that I also see is childcare. Um, we we want to talk about eliminating systems that are holding families back from achieving their full potential. If you're a single mom, like I was at one point in time with two kids, in order for me to work, I had to pay close to $1,600 because I had two babies. And that wasn't even covering, I mean, that, that was my salary. That was pretty much what my take-home pay is. And then what was I going to eat with? So childcare is another way that we can start working towards um, creating a more equitable system for everybody in our community to be able to achieve the best that they can be. My next question is, is how will you advance K-12 education for underserved populations, especially students of color and indigenous students on and off the reservations? You know, one of the biggest things that we're noticing is we, we see that especially with minority communities, including Native American, Black, and Hispanic, there is a significant difference in preparation and reading age. Um, and I think that a lot of it can be taken care of not only by proper childcare early on, but also by early childhood education. Um, it is important that we provide abilities for all of our children, not just to be able to get to school, but to be able to get to school prepared to learn. And what teachers are facing day in and day out is a whole a diversity of students. Some of the students that have been able to have a lot of access to books and to enrichment opportunities, but then they have a large number of students that haven't had those experiences. Early childhood education could be a great place to start equalizing that and allowing that all of our kids, especially our minority kids, that may need a little bit of extra support because they haven't had those resources at home, not because mom and, and, or dad or whichever combination of the algorithm is, was able to, not desiring to provide it for them, 
but maybe they were working two and three jobs and they didn't have the time to do that because they were too busy providing. Um, so I think that that is one of the things. The other thing is let's make sure that we fortify the resources inside of our classroom. More than ever, our teachers are being asked not only to be teachers, they're being asked to also be therapists, they're being asked to be uh, paraeducators because they're having to work with kids that have special needs in the classroom. Um, we need to fortify that classroom so that the children that have special needs have all of the resources that they need in order for them to succeed. Thank you. The next question is, is how will you build a relationship with Haskell and the nation's university and advocate for their students and staff in the federal government? And how often can, can we expect you to be on our campus? Invite me. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Please invite me because I would love to have a relationship with Haskell. Haskell is a gym. Um, it has been a, a, a door being open for many young people, especially Native American families that maybe didn't even expect that they were going to be able to achieve a higher education. I understand the value of higher education. It's true that I don't use my molecular biology degree, um, even though I went through it, but it was formative in my life and it helped me learn so much um, and develop me as a human. Um, and I am looking forward to starting uh, to not only develop relationships, but you know, invite me over. I would love to be on campus at a minimum twice a year. And I'm saying minimum. So please invite me. <laughs> Of course, we got to go through all the proper protocols. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> all right. Only um, masks right yeah. now. <laughs> all right. Um, so our next question um, is kind of a long question. So if, you, if I need to repeat some of it, let me know. So the National Crime Information Center reports that in 2016, there were 5,712 reports of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls. Through the U.S. Department of Justice's Federal Missing Persons Database, name us, only 116 of these reports were logged in. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has reported that the murder that murder is the third leading cause of death among American Indian and Alaska Native women, and the rates of violence on reservations can be up to 10 times higher than the national average. However, no research has been done on rates of such violence among American Indian and Alaska Native women living in urban areas, despite the fact that approximately 71% of American Indian and Alaska Natives live in urban areas. So the question is, is how would you address MMIWG in Congress? And what do you think um, are the next steps after passage of Savannah's Act in September, 2020? I think that the first thing that we need to do is work with our community partners that know the data. Um, and fortify uh, those partners so that we are able not only to understand that, but then ha have, you know, good programs of better intervention um, within, you know, the, the community so that these things don't happen. Um, I did not know that out of 5,000, only 100 and something um, were reported. And it just goes to show yet again, um, when we talk about the needs of our community and we talk about equity, we often talk about the Black community and the Hispanic community, but there's so many things that are happening in the Native American communities that we just don't hear about. Um, so, so my request to you and, uh, and to the community is going to be, please, let's establish a relationship so that we start working with organizations like the YWCA um, and with academic institutions so that we can start not only creating a deeper understanding of what the root cause of, of the violence is, so that we can provide batterer intervention um, and mental health support, but also so that we can start giving a voice to it so that we can figure out solutions to the situation. Okay, and in closing, what are your final thoughts you'd like to share with voters? Um, this is the most probably consequential election that we'll have in the last hundred years. The most consequential. There's so many things that are on the ballot right now. The most important one being healthcare. Um, our country is going through the continued growing pains of people talking about disparities, people talking about how we all need to come together as a nation to understand the needs of the people that we are supposed to represent. And make no mistake, the issues that are on the table are not partisan at all. 
I don't think that there is one person that is concerned about their political affiliation when they go to an emergency room. I don't think that there is a person that is wondering um, who their representative is when they receive that first catastrophic bill or when they get a call being told that a family member is ill. I think it's a shame just a few weeks ago, one of my good friends who's only 37 years old that lives in Hiawatha ended up having a heart attack. And his first concern was, how am I gonna pay for this? We're the richest country in the world, yet we choose to not insure our families. We are in the middle of a pandemic. We need a government that is going to advocate for you and follow the science, that is not going to minimize the impacts of this pandemic and that is not going to divide our economy and our health. We can work together, but in order for us to do that, we need leadership that cares about people more than party. We need people willing to roll up their sleeves people that make people a priority. And that's what I vow to do for Kansas. I'm not concerned about your party. I'm concerned about your health. I'm concerned about the education of your children. I'm concerned about the safety of our communities. I am concerned about serving you, whether you elect me or not. So in this election, understanding that we have so much work to do, please go out and vote. We need you to exercise your vote. Just a hundred years ago, women were not able to do so. We cannot forget that there were many that fought for us to be able to have this right. And now more than ever, we need those voices that feel unheard to make themselves known. So please, vote, vote. And if I didn't say it before, vote. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being with us, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Gipp, for joining us as well. I do want to say we will have another candidate forum for Kansas Senate District 20 on Women for Kansas Northeast Facebook on Friday at 4 p.m. And this video will also be posted on our Facebook page and will be reposted on Women for Kansas YouTube if you'd like to watch it there as well. And Michelle, where can people find out more information about you? They can go to michelleforkansas.com. They could go to Facebook and look for Michelle for Kansas, or they can go on Twitter and look at Michelle for Kansas. You'll get information there. Um, we have a whole bunch of fun videos and um, there's a lot of information out there. So please just go there. And if you have any, any questions, just email info at Michelle for Kansas and we'll be happy to answer any question that you may have. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.